Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. Nineteen seventy-five, I had a young man <clears throat> who worked with me. I had just become a Christian, didn't know up from down. His name was Jim Nimlos, and he would get up early in the morning, early, and uh, take me through the Word. He lived right down the hall from where I was living. I was in college at the time, in a fraternity there, and he would uh, meet with me every morning at five o'clock before he went to work. So every morning, uh, five days a week, he met with me and would take me through the Word of God. Then he got me plugged into a church there and uh, got me involved in the Friday night, college night. There were about 500 college kids there, and it was just a chance for, at that age, I was a college kid, and I knew everything back then. I knew everything. And it was just, I knew it. And I couldn't help it. I just, I knew everything, you know. And uh, so I was with 499 other folks that knew everything, too. We had a blast. And uh, we just had fun. And he just helped me with my walk a lot. I ended up in San Francisco, going to San Francisco College of Mortuary Science, and a guy by the name of Dale Buford, another man by the name of John Petrovich, took me under their wing. These were old guys. They were like in their 50s. And I was like 20, so they were old guys. And they took me under their wing, and they discipled me. And they... Um, put me up in pulpits on Saturdays after our prayer meetings. I was a Gideon. I was the youngest Gideon in the state of Minnesota at that time. And I went to California. I was the youngest Gideon in the state of California. And these were old guys. They would take me to empty churches on Saturdays um, before I would do street witnessing in the morning. And then afterward, we'd go into these old churches, big fancy churches in San Francisco that were empty anyway. And they'd put me up in the pulpit and they'd have me speak publicly because me and speaking publicly did not go well. I am not a public speaker. Freaked me out. And they would uh, just uh, do pretty much what we do in lit class now. They would uh, stop me. Don't do that. You're doing this. Why are you nervous? It's just us, that type of thing, you know. And Spent a year just investing in me with scripture memory and reading and teaching me and showing me how to do street witnessing and that kind of stuff. Real appreciative of that. I ended up in Dickinson, North Dakota, and a man by the name of Myron Losey from our church came to me and says, Con, I want to disciple you. And I'm like, uh, what now? So I, I want to disciple you. Okay. So he'd come over to my house once a week and he took me through the book of Ephesians of all things. And I said, Myron, why are you doing this? He says, I don't know. I just, God put it on my heart. I need to disciple you. So for about a year, he discipled me. Took me through the book of Ephesians and prayed with me, uh, Taught me how to pray. He spent a lot of time with me. At that time, I was going through a real difficult time in my life. I so wanted a child, and it wasn't happening. So he came over, and he said, I'll quietly pray with you, that God will give you guys a, a child. And it was towards the end of that time that our daughter Christy came into the world. So Myron's those had a special place in my heart. I moved down here to Albuquerque, and he was an engineer. He was up in Williston, North Dakota, on a small plane, and they were taking off in that plane. He was a passenger in, in, in there. They hit a, uh, a vehicle parked on the side of the runway, and the plane flipped, and he was killed. Went home to be with the Lord, just like that. I've always been real thankful for Myron Losey and what he did in my life. I came down here, had a number of different people not do one-on-one -on -one discipleship with me, but class discipleship with me. So I, I learned the concept of class discipleship, and it was like amazing for me, absolutely amazing for me. I ended up going into ministry in Santa Fe, and uh, one of the first things I did is 
I pulled a Myron Losey on a guy. His name was Todd Timmons, my first guy I discipled. And uh, I just started meeting with him. And then I met with another guy and another guy, and pretty soon I had like 17 guys in this little church working one-on-one, -on -one, and it was like pretty much killing me. So I started class discipleship. So we started class, putting in little mini classes and doing discipleship with the guys. Got well over 100 guys that we were just discipling. It was one of the sweetest times, just discipling these guys. It was great. Then about, I don't know, six, seven, eight years in, um, the wives started complaining. Why are you only discipling the men? Why aren't you discipling the women? And I said, well, the husbands are supposed to disciple the women. Well, they're not. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not going to disciple you. Sorry, I can't do that. And they said, well, can you do a class? I said, I can do a class. I mean, who's going to show up to a class at noon on a Tuesday? The first day we had a, well over 100 women show up at that class. I was like, whoa, it's a bunchy in here, huh? So we did a women's discipleship class, and it was just a sweet, sweet time. Came down here, we started doing discipleship down here when the church started. How many of you have been either in class discipleship, which would be LIT, or individual discipleship since you've been at Washed by the Word? Stand up quick if you've been part of that. Tom's up there. You look around, these are the guys that have been in the discipleship. How has it worked? Been okay? It's all right. It's all right. So there's the discipleship. Thanks, guys. So these are some of the discipleship, and that's where the leadership of the church comes from. Well, now, as of late, in the last couple of months, I've had women coming to me. We go, oh, here we are, six, seven-year mark. Are you kidding me? Serious? Why don't you have discipleships for the women? I said, I don't do discipleship for women. Your husband's supposed to be discipleship. Well, they're not doing it. It's like, well. So, June 6th, Tuesday, at noon, washed by the word. This is not for guys, this is only for women. There's an age range, anywhere from four to 104, that's it. <laughs> but if you're in that range, if you wanna come, the cost is $20, no, I'm just playing, it's free. Just come, just come. We'll probably do it at Jerry's place, I'm thinking, if you're a working lady, bring a lunch, pack a lunch, sit down and have lunch. If you have children, Dina, what are you going to have to do if you have children? There you go. So Dina's mom. <laughs> Dina's mom is watching kids. Thanks, that's awesome. No. <laughs> but find, find your own child care, but we'd love to have you. So that's Tuesday, Tuesday at noon. That's June 6th. We we'll start in discipleship. And um, the women's discipleship is a little bit different than men's. I'm going to call it leadership involvement training for women. Uh, but it, it'll be something I think that uh, I think everyone will enjoy. It's, it, it's given real good fruit in the past. Men that are here, um, if you're ever interested in being discipled, come and talk with me. I'll be glad to set something up. So if that's something you want to do, then uh, I'll be glad to help you with that. All right, with that, off we go. First John. Uh, way in the back of the Bible, Will gave us the page number, and uh, that's where we are, 1 John chapter 1. Last week, we took a look at what the state of Christianity was like, remember, when John wrote this letter. We're going to hit just three of the quick things that we talked about last week, just as a way of reminder. We remember, at the time John wrote this letter, it was late in the century now. The last thing that had been written that becomes part of what we call the New Testament was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. In 68, both Peter and Paul were martyred under Nero. In 70, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Just prior to that period, John and many of the Christian leaders left Jerusalem. John went up into the area of Ephesus. Many believe he took the mother of Jesus with him and they were in Ephesus. Could you imagine you're pastoring the church in Ephesus, young Timothy, and here comes the Apostle John walking in, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, we have John in the church. That would be like really cool. So he was there. 
And he probably brought Mary with him, which would be like amazing. Could you imagine? There's no record that they worshipped her, by the way. I find that interesting. But they, um, they were there in Ephesus. The Bible has not been written yet, but the, uh, the New Testament has not been canonized yet, but the, the books in it have been written. Everything except what John is going to write. But John doesn't write it for another 20 years. So we got this 20 to 25 years of silence. And during this time, those people that were in Ephesus when the church was planted under Paul, they've passed the baton to their kids. And sometimes even the next generation. So now it's a second generation, third generation Christians in the church. And something interesting has happened. The newness of Christianity is worn off. Remember we talked about this and, and now all of a sudden the thrill of knowing Jesus is gone and it's more like, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, you know. Later on, remember in the book of Revelation, Jesus writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, you have great doctrine. You're doing good stuff. But I have this one thing against you. Remember what it was? You left your first love. You don't love Jesus anymore. He's not number one anymore. For some of them, it was the church. Maybe for some of them, it was, we have John in the church. Or maybe it was just the world. Because that was the second thing we saw last week. Holiness, hagias, to be different, went away. Christians no longer wanted to be different than the world. They wanted to be like the world. They wanted to blend into the world. And you know what happens when we blend into the world. You know. Anybody ever blend into the world for a minute or two? Anybody besides me? Yeah. You know what happens. When we blend into the world, we become like the world. When we blend into the world, we start to do things that the world does, and we justify it. For me, I can't speak for you, but for me, when I'm in the world, Christians stop being nice. They start becoming hypocrites and judgmental. And Christians are kind of like, I don't like to be around them. I like being in the world because they're nicer. Well, of course they're nicer. I'm, I'm sitting with them. They like that. That's what was going on at the time John wrote this letter. They had lost their first love. Now when they lost their first love, they had stopped being different from the world. They became like the world and justified being like the world. They started to justify their sin. The world put a hook in and took them out. All of a sudden, they justified what they were doing in their life. By the way, this is James right here. Hey, James. Second time here. Yep. From the west side. Yep. Stand up so you know who you are. This is James. Oh, my mic's cutting out. This is James right here. I'm cutting out when I get too far away. I just wanted to welcome him because second time, a second time returner gets a welcome. First time, it's like, I'm here, I'm never going back there again. Second time, cool. Thank you. And these are your kids. Yes. I forgot your daughter's name, but I remember Davis. Melissa? Melissa? And Davis. Melissa, how old are you, Melissa? 12. 12? I'm 62. It's good to meet you. <laughs> this is Davis. Davis is 16. Sibola. Welcome, guys. Appreciate you coming back a second time. Thank you. Thank you. But at any rate, they became like the world. So they were Christians in name only, not in behavior. It's been said, I'd heard it years ago, if you were arrested, use this one all the time. I'll shut this guy off. We ordered a new one of these, and it's here in town. It's just not here at the church. I'm not going to say why. I'm not going to say that it's in Sid's other car. I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> I love you, man. You know that. Okay, so here we are. At any rate. But so that's, that's the state of Christianity at the time this letter is written. It's jacked up is what it is. It's much like Christianity today in the United States of America. For many people, it's just a club. For many people, it's just a joke. It's, I think I've done enough good things to get into heaven, I hope. I think I'll make it. I'm pretty good. But I've got to have a little bit of world. Come on. What's the purpose of living if I don't have world? 
My question is, what's the purpose of being a Christian if you don't have Jesus? Amen. What are you doing? What are you doing? Forget about it. Jump in the world, have a blast. Go for it. Just don't tell people you're a Christian. Because that really messes up and confuses people. Just say it. I'm not a Christian, I just play church. Say it. It's all right, say it. Just say it. I think after service, we'll have a dedication service right up front. If you want to come and dedicate yourself to say, I'm going to stop being a hypocrite. I'm just going to tell people I'm not really a Christian. I just play church. So I have prayer for you all that you can really have a good testimony for being a hypocrite. But enough is enough. You know what I'm saying. So, easy familiarity with Christianity. Second and third generations left their first love. Holiness was not sought out. It was avoided. And if you were going to be a Christian, well, then, you know, I don't know. And Gnosticism was an active enemy of the church at this time. It was like crazy. Gnosticism, to know. The Gnostics believed they knew something that nobody else did. It was sort of like the Masons today. We got the secret knowledge for you. And by the way, if you're a Mason here, get out. What's the matter with you? That's, that's crazy. Get out of Masons, man. Come on. That's crazy. But at any rate, we'll talk about that later. We're going to lose half the church today, aren't we? Oh, well, that's... That's, that's life. That's what it is. Don't really care, to be honest with you. Don't really care. But if you're a Mason, get out of Masons. Come on. Come on. Christian has no business being a Mason. Serious? Serious? At any rate, the Gnostics were like the Masons. Same thing. They had secret knowledge. If you come into us and do our secret ceremonies and say our different things, then you can be part of us and you'll be a Gnostic. Well, Gnosticism grew big time in this 25-year quiet time. The New Testament books weren't being written. They were done now, except for what John's going to write. And Gnosticism went crazy, went absolutely crazy. Now, we talked last week about some of the teachings of the Gnostics. We mentioned a little bit about Semism or Docetism and how they would teach that Jesus wasn't really really a man. He just seemed to be a man. He was like a spirit. He wasn't really a man. We talked about the, about the Ebionites just a little bit that, that said, well, you know, you got to still be a, a good Jew to, to be a, a follower of God. And, and um, we even mentioned a little bit the Ebionites seemed to originate it down as a group of the Essenes that became the Ebionites after Jesus came. They were looking for the Messiah. He came but they kind of had their little twisted Gnostic view of that. We talked a little bit about Serinthus, where we saw groups of the Gnostics who said Jesus wasn't really a man. Another group of Gnostics says Jesus wasn't really God. He was, just appeared to be God. And then we had a guy named Serinthus who lived in Ephesus who was whacked. And what he would say is, well, you understand that the Christ, the spirit of Christ and Jesus are two separate entities. Jesus was a man, and the Spirit of Christ came upon Jesus at his baptism, and then it left Jesus just before his crucifixion. So, it, two separate things, and, and that was the doctrine of Serinthus. Well, John is going to deal with that in no uncertain terms. We talked about how John was known as one of the sons of thunder. He and his brother James called that by Jesus. And we mentioned how when Jesus was walking through Samaria, remember, in the Samaritans wouldn't let Jesus spend the night with his disciples in that city. And James and John came alongside of Jesus and says, Jesus, do you want us just to call down fire from heaven like Elijah did and just smoke this town, just get them out of here? And Jesus says, no, no, you're missing. That's not why I came. I didn't come to kill people. I came to love people, to seek people, to reach people. In fact, Jesus never went down hard on sinners. He only had one group of people that Jesus ever chastised in a very strong way. Do you remember who that group was? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and the scribes. Exactly. Those would be called religious folk. Those would be called hypocrites. Those would be called those who said that they are godly, but they're just bogus. Would you agree with me on that? That's the only ones. So those of us in here today that are sinners, man, Jesus got a message for you. Those of us that think we're all that and we're not sinners, woo, the Lord's got a message for you today in 1 John. That's the whole message today is those of us who think we're all that, we're going to leave for today, but we're not all that. We're just not all that. We are stinking sinners. That's the good news. Some of us are in the world right now. We profess to follow Jesus, we're in the world. That's called sin. Some of us 
in this group right here, more likely than not, have never given our life to Christ. And you're just kind of, well, here we are in church. This guy's kind of talking weird, huh? You can have an opportunity to come to Christ today. Some of us here think we're all that. We're going to have an opportunity today to really take, be confronted with that. And maybe even get to the point where we can look at Jesus in the eyes today and say, Lord, I'm not all that, am I? Forgive me, Lord. It's time for me to be a Christian, for real. Going to have that opportunity today. So that's what we're going to be looking at today in 1 John, because that's what 1 John deals with. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 1 again. We kind of did an intro, and Lord willing, we're going to finish up all the way through chapter 2, verse 2. We'll give it a shot. Here we go. The beginning of living in God's light. 1 John chapter 1, the first four verses. We're going to see that John in his letter here talks about living in God's light, chapters 1 and 2. He's going to talk about living in God's love, chapters 3 and 4. And he's going to talk about having God's life in chapter 5. So we're going to look at light, love, and life in 1 John. So the first two chapters are looking at this light picture that John uses. Li beginning to live in God's light. How do we do that? It starts with Jesus. That's where it starts. It doesn't start with a church. It doesn't start with a movement. It starts with Jesus. So that's what we're going to look at as we get into the text here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. He starts off and he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Now, as we take a look at this, we're going to see right out the get-go, John doesn't say, remember, to the church in Ephesus or to the church in Asia. He doesn't say that. He just starts to address immediately this Gnostic heresy that has infiltrated the church. This Gnostic heresy that, by the way, is still in evangelical Christianity today, worldwide. So 1 John is a good book for all of us to go through on a regular basis to get rid of some of the stuff that the enemy continually throws our way in our midst right here. As we look at John, 1 John, we're going to see he's going to show that Jesus was man. Take a look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1. He says, that which was from the... Go to the next slide, Sandy. Uh, it says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we, have, which we have seen and looked upon. The word seen there means to see with our physical eyes. But when we get to this looked upon, theomai, it means to view with attention, with admiration, to really study and go in, into awe as we look at it. It's, it's a big thing. And we're going to see that the first thing he shows us is that Jesus is man, shows his humanity. John uses the word in his gospel in chapter 1, verse 14, when he says, We beheld his glory, is to look at, study, and be in awe. So he says here, We saw him with our eyes, and we looked upon him in great attention. Later on, we saw, and our hands have handled it, notice. To handle, it means to feel, to touch, to move our hands over it, over and over again, to really examine it. It's the same word that Luke used when he said Jesus, after his resurrection, met with his disciples, and he told the disciples, handle me. Make certain that this is me, this is my body. He says, touch me, feel me, run your hands over me. So the first thing we see in John's writing is he attacks this false doctrine that says, well, Jesus isn't really man. He says, oh yeah, he's man. We saw him. We heard him, we handled him, he was a man. Then he goes on to say in verse 2, I want to declare to you eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. He goes again right after the Gnostics. They claimed we have special knowledge. We know he wasn't really God. We know he wasn't really God and man. He was man, not God. Others say he was God, not man. Others say he was God for a while. Some say, well, the, the spirit of the Christ came upon him for a while. John says, we were there. You weren't. 
remember. We know you don't. We heard, we saw, we studied, we handled. You didn't. And in chapter 1, verse 2, he declares his deity notice. When he says the life was manifested, we've seen, bear witness, declare to you that eternal life. That eternal life which was, which, which was with the Father. That deity that goes way back there. Why does John declare this? He tells us that you can have fellowship with us and that your joy may be full. And that's where we finished off last week, remember. He says, I'm telling you this, I'm declaring this to you so you can have fellowship with us around Jesus and that your joy might be full. Now we get into verse 5. And verse 5 all the way through 2.2. Chapter 2, verse 2, we see now the basis of living in God's light. It starts with Jesus. Now we're in living in the light of God. We can have fellowship. But how can we stay there? What's the basis of staying in the family of God in fellowship with God and with others? What is the basis of having joy? And we're going to see what John tells us is the basis is forgiveness. It's not being sin-free. It's not being all that. It's forgiveness. So now he's going to address some more claims that the Gnostics put out here that are kind of some tough claims. But we're going to see that Jesus is man. Jesus is God. And we're going to see again in John's writings that Jesus is both God and man. The word for God in the Greek is theos. And the word for man in the Greek is anthropos. So we just remember that Jesus is God-man. Or if you want to sound like you know what you're talking about and just know somebody, there's a big old word they teach you in seminary. And it makes you sound like you're all that. So when you hear this word, don't freak out. It just means God-man. What's the word for God? Theos. What's the word for man? Anthropos. So if he's a God-man, we just say he's Theos Anthropos, right? So if you hear Theos, Theos Anthropos, it sounds like a lot of... So we just shorten it. And we just take the T-H-E of Theos and put it together. And we get Theanthropos, or Theanthropic. Doesn't that sound all fancy? You just learned a big old seminary word. The theanthropic nature of Jesus. All that means is he's God and man. So when you hear these big words, don't freak out. Don't think, well, I don't know nothing. You know everything you need to know. Do you know Jesus? You're good. You're good to go. But that's just one of those big old words, the theanthropic nature of Christ. All that means is he is God and man. And that's what 1 John chapter 1 is all about. The Gnostics... We're really trying to mess with Jesus, who he was. John's the last surviving disciple. He says, I saw him, I was there, I touched him, I heard him. And now in verse 5, I'm going to tell you what I heard. I'm going to declare it to you. This is straight from the pen of John through the power of the Holy Spirit. When he says in verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. So here it is. John was there with Jesus. He heard what Jesus said, and now he's going to write it, and we're going to read it. And the very first thing he says, notice, he says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Notice it does not say God is a light. Later on, it's going to say God is love, not God is a love. Later on, it's going to say God is life. He's not going to say God is a life. No, God is light. No definite article in front of light. God is light. That's who he is. That is his very nature. He is light. Throughout scripture, light is used to refer to pureness or holiness. Darkness to sin. That's just what it is, our unholiness. So we have light and we have darkness. And as we all know, darkness is dark until a little bit of light comes in. I remember being in the, the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky years ago with, with Paul Frederick. Uh, he was... Uh, Oh, one of my teachers, he's also a pastor, the only Christian pastor in the town that I grew up in. I was not a Christian by any stretch of the imagination, and he was doing a cross-country trip to see my mom down in Florida. She was down in Florida visiting his family down there at Clearwater, Florida. 
and he needed someone just to ride with him, and I'm a sophomore in high school, and he says, Con, you want to come down there with me? He was a cool teacher. I had no idea that, you know, he was a Christian. I didn't know what a Christian was. I was, I was Lutheran. I'm good. So I got in this vehicle. Can you imagine from Minnesota all the way to Florida with a born-again pastor? Just me and a born-again pastor. I slept as much as I could, but you can only sleep so much. But we went into Mammoth Cave. And uh, we were in there, and the guide told us, he says, you know, you are now experiencing true, complete darkness. He says, and if you stay in here for ever, however long you want to stay in here, your eyes will not adjust to the light because there is no light at this spot. It'll just always be dark. He says, but watch this. And he, he took a match and lit a match. And this entire cavern, just you could see all of a sudden, just a little bit of light, whew, it was there. A little bit of light removes darkness. A little bit of darkness doesn't remove light. And he says here, God is light. God is pure. God is holy. In our Habakkuk study, in Habakkuk 1.13, remember, uh, last Thursday we were looking, God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity, to, to behold sin. God is holy. We said that is the one word in the Old Testament that is used most by God to describe himself. That's his number one trait that God puts forth to us, that he's holy. He's holy. And it says here, God is light. This is a this picture of his holiness. He says, God is, is light. I'm going to give to you what we heard from him, that God is light and in God is no darkness at all. There is no sin at all. You see, you cannot have fellowship with God and live continually, this is the tense, in sin and say that we have fellowship with him. Sin separates us from God. Simple as that. Why would John bring that up? Because the Gnostic heresy said, you don't understand. We have secret knowledge. This body is bad. All matter is evil. The spirit is good. Of course the body's going to sin. That's how God made me. What's wrong with a little bit of sin? It's just the body. It's going to burn anyway. Calm down. It's your spirit. But you can go ahead and indulge a little bit. It's not going to hurt you. My question is this. When's the last time someone came up to you and said, you can pray a little bit. It's not going to hurt you. You were made to pray. You can pray a little bit. It's not going to hurt. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Pray a little bit. It's okay. You can read the Bible a little bit. Everybody reads the Bible a little bit. It's okay. The enemy never says that. He never says that. What does the enemy say? Give me an example. What's he say about stuff that might not be the best thing to be doing? What's that? Don't eat that piece of fruit. What's he say? He says, take the fruit a little bit. A little bite of fruit's not going to hurt you. God's holding out on you. Remember what he told Eve? He's holding out on you. He knows that in the day you eat of it, you're going to be like him. Come on. A little bite never hurt nobody. Then you point to other people that have been biting the apple. They eat an apple. They eat an apple. They eat an apple. Have a bite, man. Come on, it's an apple. Calm down. Ever had that mentioned to you? You ever hear the hiss of the enemy in those words? I usually don't hear it when I'm, when I'm being tempted. I hear it after I take a bite. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. I take a bite and then I hear like, oh, snap. Can't believe I took a bite. Well, that was what's going on with the Gnostics. They had this whole thing that you can enjoy the world. God made it for good. It's good. It's good. So, here we go. He starts off in verse 6. If we say, if we say, notice in verse 8, if we say, notice in verse 10, if we say. These are the three issues that the Gnostics had that John is going to address now. If we say, if we say, if we say. The first one in verse 6, if we say, what, what do we say? That we have fellowship with God. I'm a Christian, I walk with God, and we walk in darkness. If we say that we are a Christian and we're walking continually in sin, and that's the key here, that word walk, it's in the continuous tense and the subjective mood, which means it's a continual lifestyle. But if we are, 
saying, I'm a Christian. I have fellowship with the Lord, and we are continually walking in sin. What does he say? If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. Isn't that something? If we wa are walking in sin, we say, but we have fellowship with God while we're walking in sin. We're lying. It says here, basically we're lying to others is, is the, uh, the original language, what it's saying. We lie. We don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, if we walk in holiness, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice, when we walk in the light, it doesn't mean we're going to be sin-free. It means we're not going to be practicing continually that sin. Yes, we're going to sin, but the blood of Jesus will cleanse us. So we're not saying sin-free walking in the light. We're saying that when we sin, we respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We don't make excuses mm -hmm. for our sin and stay in the sin. But we confess our sin and we move on. So if we're walking in sin, if we say that we're, we have, we're walking in sin, but we have fellowship with God, we're lying to others. Then it goes on. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we have no sin. Sinless perfection. The Gnostics were saying that. It's not me sinning. It's my body that's sinning. Not me. My body's not going to heaven. I am. My soul. Oh, there goes my body again. We don't say it that way. How do we say it today? Well, that's how God made me. Same thing. If we say we have no sin, then in verse 8 he says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we're walking in sin, but say or we have fellowship with God, we're lying to others. If we say, well, I have no sin. I've, atta I've attained this perfection. I have no sin. I'm great. We're lying to ourselves. We're being deceived. Notice one of the reasons I believe, I believe over here, I believe one of the reasons that the New Age movement and a lot of the religions that say there is no such thing as sin is because if we admit to the fact that there is sin, we've got a problem. And if there is no remedy for sin, we've got a serious problem. So if we can just say there is no sin, God made me this way, it's okay, it's okay, then at least my conscience is good until I go to hell. But in verse 9, he says, if we say we have no sin, we're just lying to ourselves. But in verse 9, he says, here's the remedy. So you don't have to say you have no sin. There's a remedy for it. There's a remedy for our sin, guys. And it has nothing to do with you. That's what's so sweet about it. It has everything to do with Jesus. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, if we say we have no sin, I don't have a sin, I'm, I'm good. No, you're not. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, not us. He is faithful. And he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a Jesus thing. Is that beautiful or what? So that takes the pressure off now. It was the most amazing thing. I, I had a chance to do ministry for a number of years in a New Age community. Now, most of the folks that God led me to were Roman Catholic people. We had tons of Roman Catholic people in our church, probably 60, 70% of the, the folks in there were Roman Catholics. And since they never joined our church, I guess they, they always were Roman Catholics. But they were born again, Roman Catholics for sure, and they didn't go to the Catholic church for sure, but I guess they still were, I guess. I don't know what that was. But, <coughs> but there was a lot of New Age folk. Is there still a lot of New Age folk up there? Or are they kind of gone? They're still up there? They're still up there? Sweet. Well, when you talk with people of the New Age persuasion, if you try to get into just talking about the Word of God and that, they just, it's just, it's... But when you would talk to them about sin, they would blow you off. But if you talk to them about Jesus dying for your sin and the forgiveness of sin, they would have a, a moment of stoppage. And they say, you mean to tell me now? 
that if there was such a, such a thing as sin, my sins could be forgiven. Go through it. I'd love to say everyone came to Christ. No. But the few of the New Age movement that I had an opportunity to lead to Christ, it was always about the sin issue. Because guess what? It's always about the sin issue. If you're a New Age, if you're a Roman Catholic, if you're an atheist, an agnostic, a Lutheran, or if you go to wash by the word, if you're an evangelical, whatever you are, it's always about the sin issue. That's what it is. 1 John 1, 9 is true no matter what your persuasion is. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then he goes to the next one. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, well, I'm, I'm not a sinner. You're not lying to others. You're not lying to yourself. You're basically saying, God, you lie. You're calling God a liar. Why? Because of Romans 3.23. What does it say? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not me. I haven't sinned. <laughs> yeah, you have. We know when you're talking to another human being, you know you're talking with a sinner. Because the word says, all have sinned. Everybody's a sinner. But rather than worrying about everybody out there being a sinner, how many of you can see yourself in that window right there? Anybody? Can you see yourself in there? Take a look at yourself. I can see me in there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm going to say to me? You are a stinking sinner. Yeah. Your turn. Look at yourself in there, Harvey. I'm a stinking sinner. Yeah, you are. <laughs> you are, Harvey. Aren't you glad you know Jesus? Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive Amen. us our sin. Amen. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good news? It had nothing to do with you, man. Nothing to do with you. Remember some of that junk you did up in Baltimore 40 years ago? You remember some of that? I don't know nothing about it, but I'm just assuming you were in Baltimore, so I'm assuming you did some junk up there. I don't know. You know what's cool? Is Jesus doesn't remember that. God the Father doesn't remember that. Because when you came to Christ, it's gone. When he sees Harvey, he doesn't see what Harvey used to be. Now that you're born again, he sees Jesus. Amen. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Yes. That is stinking great right there. That is stinking great. So, yay, that's good. Harvey, how's your walk going right now? Very good. You've been so blessed, Harvey. God has given you time to say, make sure, Harvey, you're walking with me. Someone in this room is going to eternity next. More likely than not, it's not going to be Harvey. More likely to be one of us that thinks we're all, all that. Bam, we're dead. Hope our walk is good. Hope our walk is good. I hope we're loving Jesus. We're not playing games. Hope we're not taking others down with us. That would be a mistake of a gigantic proportion. Thank you. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. You see, guys, we can never say that we have reached the place where we are not able to sin. No, we're always able to sin. So we can never reach the place where we say we are not able to sin. But we can say, by the grace of God, I am able not to sin right now. I am able to say no right now. There's a choice coming, and I don't have to follow it just because it's offered. Just because I don't hear the s of the serpent doesn't mean I can't say no. I can say no. I can be a man of God, a woman of God, and stand up for Jesus instead of going with the world, even if it's your pastor leading you away. Even if I've got the piece of fruit. Well, he's the pastor. It must be okay. It's the pastor. No, it's not okay. It's not okay if the pastor... Where are my elders? Can I see my elders quick? It's not okay if the elders, it's not okay. It's not okay if the husband, it's not okay if it's the wife, it's not okay if it's the parent. If it is taking us away from God, it's not okay. If it's putting a temptation in front of us, it's not okay. Well, the avenue of the temptation is okay, so I guess it's okay. No. no. It's not okay. It's never okay to sin. It's not. And God has given us the power to say, I am able not to sin 
right now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13, it says, There is no temptation but that which is common to man. Do you understand that? You are not somehow in this position. Well, no one's ever seen the temptation. Nobody knows. <laughs> the temptation I've seen. No. Oh, shut up. It's your flesh being stupid. It's your flesh saying, well, I want it. We're like a big old digestive tract. Some people, we think that's all we are. We got a mouth and we eliminate and that's just, we live just to put stuff in and take stuff out. That's what we do. That's not what you are. That's not what we are. That's not, God's got something so much better for you than that. Amen. Come on now. So much better for you. God's got a beautiful plan for you. Beautiful plan for you. If you're married, look at your wife right now, guys. Look at your wife. Just look at her. That's God's gift to you. What are you doing? God has given you this gift. What are you doing to cherish this gift? tells us in Ephesians we're to love our wife, to cherish her. We're to feed her. Are you praying with your wife? Are you talking with your wife or talking at your wife? What are you doing? When's the last time, if we were to have the wives stand up and put their hand in the Bible and give an honest oath, when's the last time you've read the word to your wife? When's the last time you've just thanked your wife for being a godly woman? When's the last time, wives, you looked at your husband and said, thank you for leading me in righteousness. Thank you for protecting and covering me and not leading me into the world, but leading me closer to God. Because I know you, because God brought me to you, I am closer to Jesus than before I met you. Is that happening, guys? Is that happening? I pray it is, and I trust it is. But so very... But know for a fact, know for a fact that there is no temptation, but that is common to everybody else. You're no different than anybody else. And then Paul goes on to say, but with each temptation, he puts a trap in there so you'll never get out. No, he doesn't say that. <laughs> People right now, really, puts a trap? No, no, he doesn't say that. First Corinthians 10, 13, read it, don't know. <laughs> no, but with every temptation, he gives you a way of escape. He gives you a way to get away from the temptation. He gives you a way to say no. Isn't that something? Well, I couldn't help it. Wrong. You chose to do it. Unless God's a liar, and I don't think he is. And God has said he'll give you a way to escape out of every temptation. That's pretty cool right there. Now, he goes on. In chapter 2, the next two verses, he says, My little children, term of endearment. It's sort of like if someone's called William, you call him Bill. And if he's really tight, you call him Billy. Or Jim, Jimmy. If you're in Bulgaria, Ludmil, Ludmilski. You put a ski on the end of it. Sid, Sidski. You hear me call Sidski? That's what it means. That means like that's my buddy Sid, Sidski. You just put an SK on it. That's what this is going on here. He's writing to people he has a relationship with. He's writing to the folks here in and around Ephesus. He says, my little children. Not that he's writing to the Sunday school department. He's not. He's saying, you guys, I love you so much. i got a special relationship with you, my little children. He says, these things I write to you. Remember up in verse 3, it was so you have fellowship with us? Verse 4, your joy might be full. We see another reason. I'm writing to you so that you may not sin. Here's how you can say no. You don't have to sin, he says. I'm writing to you so, you, don't, so you, don't, you may not sin. But then he says, and if anyone does sin, so you still might sin. So this is not saying, oh, I'm never going to sin again. No, but if you do sin, here's the good news. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In the Greek, the word advocate there is the same word that John uses to describe the Holy Spirit. Here he uses that word to describe Jesus. He says we have someone to come alongside of us, someone who's called to come alongside of us to help, to be our advocate. Call is kalio, and to come alongside is para. It's the word paraclete. We use that for the Holy Spirit. Here John uses it for Jesus. Jesus has been called alongside of us. If you've ever gone to court, if you've ever had a public defender, well, that guy is supposedly called alongside of you to help you. Well, we have a real advocate here. For real. For real. If anyone sins, someone has been called alongside of us to help us. 
We have an advocate. You've heard it said, we have a Jewish attorney who's never lost a case. He has a better track record than Perry Mason and Matlock combined. <laughs> he never loses, man. He never loses. He never will lose. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, literally. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. There's a long word. You thought theanthropic was a word. How about propitiation? Whoo! Forget about it. He, no, that's the key of the whole, the whole passage is his propitiation. We're going to look at that in just a second. He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Wow. So we need to look at propitiation. Halasmas in the Greek. Kippur in the Hebrew. It's used in the book of Leviticus. It's used in the book of Exodus when it's talking about the whole tabernacle. And we close with looking at the tabernacle and we're going to throw something in there that's pretty sweet. So check this out. This is so awesome how God's word is like, oh, it's just amazing. It's amazing. But let's go back into the tabernacle now. God is telling Moses, you need to build this place where I can meet with you. And you're going to take these offerings and you're going to take the blood of the offerings and you're going to put them on this cover. That's what the word means, a cover in Hebrew, this kapoor. It's a, it's a cover. It's going to be a cover on the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to have these cherubim on top of it there. And you're going to take the blood of an animal and that blood is going to be placed on this lid, on this cover, on this kippur, on this, uh, on this, this lid. And it's just, gonna, it's, gonna, it's, it's just gonna be there. And that blood is gonna take the place, pay the price for the sin of the nation of Israel. And you're gonna do that once a year for the sins of Israel. It's going to be in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, the, the Halasmos. It's going to be that covering. It's going to be that propitiation. It's going to be that, that thing that takes the place for the sin. It's going to cover the sin. It's going to deal with the sin. It's going to take the place of your sin, and your sin's going to be forgiven for the nation of Israel. That Kippur is translated out in our English Bibles in the Old Testament as the mercy seat. It was a place where God showed mercy, right there. You could only come in there once a year on the Day of Atonement, and in between that Holy of Holies and the Holy Place, God said, I want you to make this huge veil. And that veil is going to separate sinful man from coming into my presence. Can't happen, because my holiness will take you out. That veil is going to stop it. He says, Moses, make sure when you make the veil, make sure you make it out of red and blue and purple. That's what you want. I want you to make that veil out of red, blue, and purple. So you got this red, blue, and purple veil separating the presence of God from the presence of man. One day out of the year, the high priest can go in there with the blood of an animal, and he can take that blood, and he can go ahead and take that blood and put it on the Kippur or on that Halasmos, just put it on that mercy seat, and I'll accept that for the forgiveness of the sins of the entire nation of Israel. One day a year, the Day of Atonement. That's it. Otherwise, that veil separates us. But make sure you make the, make sure you make the veil, Moses, out of red thread, blue thread, and purple thread. I find that interesting. Solomon builds a temple, the veil, red, blue, blue purple. It's destroyed. Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple. The veil, red, blue, purple. Herod remodels the veil, red, blue, purple. Thick veil, tall veil in Herod's temple in Jesus' day. Three colors on that veil. Red, blue, purple. That veil, when Jesus said it was finished, it got ripped. It took multiple priests to hang the veil from Herod's temple. It was a huge veil. That big old heavy veil ripped from top to bottom. Thick veil at that time. Thick, tall, wide veil. It ripped from top to bottom. The thing that separated God from sinful man, the sin, that veil was ripped from top 
to bottom. And when it was ripped from top to bottom, it happened right when Jesus said it is finished and he paid the price. Now it's interesting for those of you that are into types and colors and everything in Scripture. Because red has an interesting... I want to get the Bible verse. I have it in here somewhere. Sorry, guys. Red has an interesting place in Scripture. Scarlet. Red. Exodus 26, 31. Scarlet is used in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, or red, through the Hebrew name for red, which is Adam, interestingly enough. And the last red, Adam, it tells us was Jesus. Those who get into colors and typology point to red being a picture of the humanity of Jesus, the last Adam. They point to the blue of the veil, and they say blue is a color of the heavens, if you will. Now, we know that's not the exact color, but it's the color we see from here. And it reminds us of the heavens, speaking of the deity. So when they see the red and blue, they say, well, that speaks of the humanity and the deity of that veil that was ripped from top to bottom, that which separates us, because in Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus was that veil. Interestingly enough, in Hebrews 10. What happens if you take a pitcher of red water and a pitcher of blue water and mix it? What color does it become? And once you have that purple, can you separate and tell which part of the purple is the red and which part of the purple is the blue? No, it's just purple. And people will look at the veil and the, the fact that God told them, make it red, blue, and purple. Later on, he gives the writer of Hebrews saying, make sure you write in there that that veil is Jesus. How interesting, because when it comes to Serinthus saying, well, no, the Spirit of Christ came upon Jesus, and then it left, no, 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 no. When Jesus came to the earth, he was fully man and fully God. And you couldn't say, well, that's the humanity of Jesus. That's the deity of Jesus. It was Jesus. He was fully man. He was fully God. The Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus had to sit down because he was tired. There we see his humanity. In the same passage, he starts to tell her, you know, you've been with a lot of men. And the man you're with now is not your husband. You think it's okay to live together right now, folks? Really? Really? That's what the culture tells you to do. It's not what Jesus tells you to do. But we see the humanity. He was tired. The deity. He knew what was going on. Jesus knows. Isn't that something? What's amazing to me is Jesus knows what we think. That's either good news or bad news. It depends what we're thinking. What are you thinking right now? Is Jesus pleased with what you're thinking? And he's saying, this guy's crazy. If you think I'm moving out, you're wrong. No, if you're not moving out, you're wrong. You're wrong. God's not wrong. You're wrong. Remember the boat on the Sea of Galilee? Jesus again was tired. He went to sleep. They wake him up. There's a storm, Jesus. He stands up and calms the storm. Humanity and deity. Where's one star? One, it's, just, it's purple, man. It's just there. He's a perfect mixture of red and blue. Lazarus dies. Jesus weeps. The humanity. Come forth, Lazarus. Here he comes. Humanity and deity, a perfect mix. Over and over and over. I saw, found so many of these guys. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Jesus. So we look at this and we see this veil. A beautiful picture. Prefiguring a beautiful type of Christ. Hebrews 10 says it was Christ. The veil. We see this mercy seat where the blood of that animal is put on there and the sins are gone. and That animal becomes the propitiation, the mercy seat, the halasmos. You see, the halasmos, that Greek word for that seat with the blood on it, is translated into our Bibles in the New Testament, not as mercy seat, but as the word propitiation. So it says here, in Jesus himself, is the propitiation for our sins. He's the mercy seat. He's the one. It's his blood on there, not the blood of an animal. It's the blood of Jesus that deals with our sins once and for all. Now, those of you that are Calvinists 
I, I would love for you to come and talk with me after service, and if not, talk to Walter. <laughs> Walter's my resident. I'd love to talk to any Calvinist on the planet guy. And I'll send him there because he's got this down. But at any rate, it says here, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, not just for the nation of Israel, but for the whole world. Calvinism's limited atonement has got a tough, tough time with that verse. The blood of Jesus for the sins of the whole world. So if we're here today and we say, well, I got some sin on me. I don't know if God can forgive me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The blood of Jesus covers all sins, takes away all sins, deals with all sin. It's a done deal. The only way our sin will not be forgiven is if we refuse to confess and turn from our sin. If we decide to stay in our sin and live in our sin, good luck with that. But I'm here to tell you God loves you. It is not God's desire for uh, any of us to continue on in our sin. That is not his desire. He loves you. He knows that we're sinners. We're sinners, remember, because of the federalism. Remember back in, in Romans, we talked about the federalist nature of humanity. When Adam sinned, we all developed a sin nature. So we're all sinners. That's what we are. But God loves you. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give in to temptation. Don't be like the church was when John wrote this letter. Don't be that second, third generation that's lost their zeal for Jesus Christ. Don't be like the church was there that lost their zeal to stand up and be different from the world. Whatever your world is, be different from that world. Be different from that world. If everybody's doing it, then you probably shouldn't be. Stand for Christ for real. Stand for Christ for real. I don't know what more we can say on this passage today, but I want to encourage you. Realize that God's got you. Realize that Jesus died for you. Realize you can place your faith in Jesus Christ. Your sins will be forgiven. Realize that it's not okay to compromise with the world. It's not. That's wrong. Don't compromise. Don't allow the world to take away your joy. Don't allow the world to take away the fellowship that you could have with your God, the fellowship you could have with Christian people. Don't hide your stuff. Don't hide stuff. It's one of the ways, at least in my life, I can tell if I'm doing something wrong, yeah. if I'm hiding. If I gotta hide it, that's probably not a good idea. I never hide. When, when I go to a restaurant, I love to study in restaurants. I love re restaurant studying. That's just the best, because you sit there and they just keep bringing you tea and coffee. They just keep bringing it to you. It's great. You pay once and it's just all you can drink. It's great, I love it. So I love studying in restaurants. I never hide my Bible studying in a restaurant in the United States. I just don't. Amen. I don't look over my shoulder. Man, I hope Will doesn't come in here and catch me reading my Bible. I'd be, ooh, ooh. If you've got to hide it, it's probably wrong. Simple as that. If it's causing a problem with your parents, with your kids, with your husband, with your wife, but I have my right to do it. But if it's causing problems at home, that's probably of God. That's probably God just saying, I want your marriage to to blow up on you. I love the fact when you guys go to bed angry with each other and one of you sleeps on the couch. That's just God's perfect will for you. Do you think? Do you hear the hiss and all of that? Yes. If wearing brown shoes makes my wife happy, then I wear brown shoes. Now that sounds goofy because I don't like brown shoes. You notice the color of my shoes. They're brown. I like to wear black shoes. I just like black shoes. I don't like brown shoes. And my wife says, baby, you should be wearing brown shoes or that. When you're wearing that color of pants, you have something to pop a little bit. And I said, brown? I got a black belt, black shoes. No, 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 baby. Brown, brown belt, brown shoes with blue. Really? I'm 62 years old. Serious? So you know what I did? I put on brown shoes and brown belt. 
You know why I did that? Because wives have influence over their husband, don't they? For good or for bad. I can't believe it. I walked in the other day wearing brown and brown. I said, hey, I like those. That's a nice brown. And I go, oh, she'd tell you to say that. Come on. <laughs> no one ever says, you, I like your shoes. That's because they're always black. Now. Oh, okay. But wives can influence for good or for bad. A leader doesn't, isn't a dictator. You will listen to what your wife has to say. But a leader will say no if it's wrong. If it's wrong, then that's no. That's what a leader does. Now, if I just let my wife lead, you know what happens within two or three years? Whatever you say, baby. Whatever you say, baby. Whatever you say, baby. All of a sudden, she calls me baby, but not in a nice way. I didn't want another kid. I wanted a husband. I got this, I got this, another kid I'm raising. I can tell you times I've heard that. Because men become wimps. They don't lead their wife. Not dictate, but lead their wife. Lead her into godliness. It's not a loving husband that says, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's a noodle. <laughs> don't be a noodle head, man. Don't be a noodle head. Be a man. Your wife married a man, not a noodle. Yes. Yes. Be the man. Be the man. You lead with love. Cherishing, but listening. Wives have great ideas. They do. Not all of them. Not all the ideas are great. They got some weird ideas, too, because they're human. They got some weird ideas sometimes. But God speaks to me through my wife more than any other person on the planet. I love it. Babe, are you sure you want to do that? I think so. So I go pray a little bit. You know, maybe I shouldn't do that right now, huh? Yeah, I don't know. It's up to you. Whatever you think. I love you for doing that. And I go, whoo. And we'll be like, man, I'm glad I didn't do that. Whoo, that would have been bad. God can use wives to help us make certain we stay on the path. But God, but the enemy can also use wives to take us off the path. So guys, listen, discern, and be a man. Be a man. Be a leader. That's all I got to say. <laughs> so if we think we have no sin, we're calling God a liar because God says all have sinned. If we say we haven't sinned, we're deceiving ourselves. If we say, well, I can sin, but I'm a Christian, it's okay. We're just lying to others. I have fellowship, it's good. God's got a great plan. The holosmos, our, pro our propitiation, our advocate. We have Jesus, guys. He loves you. It's a matter of just stop the game, stop pretending, be Christian folk. Truly give our life to Christ. We're going to pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much just for this one chapter here in 1 John. Lord, as we look at it today, we, we just see how easy it is to get caught up in religion, in hypocrisy, into thinking we're all that when, Lord, we know we're nothing more than saved people who sin. But God, our desire is not to sin in the present. Not to worry about tomorrow, just live for you today. In each day. Lord, it's easy for us to convince other folks to agree with us, to be involved in our, our foolishness. God, forgive us for that. God, it's so easy to become a second, third generation Christian. It's so easy to give in to the pressures of the world, to somehow get involved with people's foolishness as a way of trying to be a witness to them when in fact it destroys our witness. God, help us to be holy, holy people. Lord, in the quietness of this moment, we first want to thank you for the wonderful gift of forgiveness that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, fully God, fully man, forever in that state, shedding his blood that our sins might be forgiven. Lord, it is so easy, especially at this time in this culture, to 
compartmentalize our life, to have our church life and our world life. God, forgive us for that. God, help us to truly just be Christian people. Loving you because of the love you've shown to us. While we are acting foolish out there into the world, God, you died for us. You loved us and you drew us to yourself. God, thank you for that. Lord, it's so easy to get caught up in stuff. In the quietness of this moment right now, God, there might be some of us here, we just want to confess our sin to you. truly purpose in our hearts to be Christian people. Stop the game playing. To really walk with you. Lord, we give ourselves to you. We choose to follow you. To pick up our cross and to follow you. We know there's a cost but it's nothing compared to the price you paid for us. Lord, thank you for the privilege of knowing the gospel and an opportunity right here today to get in step with you, to truly confess, repent, and walk with you. Oh, Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for, for forgiving us. Jesus' name. Amen.